So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, I'm Blair Thomas, uh, the director of the Puppet Festival, and uh, very glad to welcome you here to the seventh floor of the Studio Theater for th our th the third of our um, uh, art, uh, book talks about puppetry. And um, uh, today uh, is um, being moderated by Dacia Posner. So, uh, Dacia is a, 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 a scholar and a, a puppeteer and a dramaturg and a professor at Northwestern University. And uh, so we're very glad that she's able to, to fill this role today. And um, so without further ado, I'll pass it on to Dacia. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, I'm so excited to talk about this new book. Claudia has been my colleague for a long time and I heard a lot of this book in bits and pieces over various conferences and phone conversations and on a bus in South Africa <laughs> and so um, I'm really really excited to finally have been able to read it um, and I have to say it's one of the more generous and accessible books I have ever read and so I'm, I'm really excited to talk about it with you all um, and with, with, uh, with Claudia first. So let me tell you a little bit about the order of the day. We're going to spend probably 40 minutes in conversation. I've tried to set up a conversation that essentially um, walks you through the order and the ideas of the book so that you feel like you know what we're talking about. We have some images from the book as well. And then we'll turn it over to you and you can ask all your amazing questions. But first, let me do a bio. All right. Claudia Orenstein is professor of theater and performance at Hunter College CUNY and a scholar of puppetry, performing objects, material performance, also activist theater, both in regard to contemporary practices globally and to traditional forms in India and Japan. She's founding editor of Puppetry International Research, PIR, an online peer review scholarly journal devoted to puppets, masks, and related arts. Along with the new book we're discussing today, Reading the Puppet Stage, Reflections on the Dramaturgy of Performing Objects, <laughs> she has co-edited several scholarly anthologies devoted to puppetry, Puppet and Spirit, Ritual, Religion, and Performing Objects with Tim Cusack. Don't miss the discussion of that book here tomorrow at 4.30. Women in Puppetry, Critical and Historical Inve Investigations with Elisa Mello and Kariad Astles, which won the UNMA USA Nancy Staub Award in 2022, and the Rutledge Companion to Puppetry and Material Performance, edited with me also and John Bell. She worked as a dramaturg on Stephen Earnhardt's multimedia production, Wind Up Bird Chronicle, shown in Edinburgh and Singapore, and on Tom Lee and Kurume Nyingyo master Koryu Nishikawa the Fist Shanks Mare, uh, a feature of this festival a couple of years ago. She's also the author of Festive Revolutions, the Politics of po uh, Popular Theater and the San Francisco Mime Troupe, co-editor with James Peck of Elizabeth Lecomte, Ping, Ping Chong, Robert Lepage Multimedia Interrogations, and an intro to theater textbook, The World of Theater Tradition and Innovation, co-authored with Mira Fellner. She's a longtime board member of the puppetry organization UNMA USA and the recipient of a 21-22 Fulbright Research Fellowship for research on ritual puppetry in Japan. Welcome, Claudia. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was the short version. <laughs> that was the short version. I was oh, like, oh my goodness, goodness Claudia, you have a lot of books. <laughs> Um, so what I wanted to talk about today, uh, as I was just saying to the to our amazing audience here, one of the things I really love about your book is how generous it is. What you do essentially is you begin at your beginning, at the moment when you didn't know anything about puppets, you just had this curiosity and you just had this suspicion that watching puppetry is different from watching live actor theater. And so you put together this reading group and you read all this stuff and there wasn't the sort of explosion of scholarship then that there is now in, in part because you're a central part of that explosion of, of scholarship. So I just wanted, if, wanted, wanted to know if you could talk to us a little bit about why you wanted to write this book, first of all, and 
Second of all, why you chose this humble and generous and accessible tone. Okay, thank you. First of all, thanks uh, for all being here and thank you, Dacia, for the lovely introduction and Paulette for helping out and for this fabulous festival. Um, I feel really honored to be here. Um, so uh, let's see, I, the, the book comes from several things. Um, I teach at Hunter College, uh, which um, is a city university campus. We have a theater department that's not, that's not, no, we don't have a puppetry program. You know, it's just I once in a while get to teach a puppetry course. And uh, I've been teaching these um, classes and we often have a mix of undergraduates, uh, MA students when we had our MA program, MFA playwrights, and sometimes PhD students. So I call it the one-room schoolhouse. You know, everybody comes in and every people are smart, they have backgrounds, and mostly backgrounds in theater. And everybody's new to puppetry. Although sometimes I have a professional puppeteer who's in there and you know, you never know who's gonna show up at Hunter. Um, and uh, uh, one impulse, there are several impulses to this book. One was that there are things that every time I teach this course, I want them to know. It's like you know, we have a whole theater department with all courses in all different areas, but we only get one puppetry class, and this semester just meeting once a week, you know, for two hours, and yet there's this whole world of puppetry that I want them to know about. So I want them to know about all the venues and um, um, organizations. I want them to know about some of the wonderful artists. I want them to know how to think about it. And um, it's a lot of exhaustive material to be sort of telling them, you know, every time. So partly this book is a kind of compendium of that, like, okay, it's, and I just started teaching that class yesterday, so uh, chapter one is what I would have said, you know, today in class, you could go read it, let's talk about it. So that's one impulse. Mm -hmm. And I think the generosity that you're describing, and thank you for that, kind of comes out of that too, because um, of the, the students that we have, you know, that they um, are smart and they're from theater backgrounds, but don't know anything about puppetry and my um, goal is to rope them in, <laughs> you know, and yeah. make them puppet lovers. Yeah. Um, so that's one uh, reason. I think the another impulse in the book is that um, uh, being involved in the puppetry world so much, and I come from a theater background, uh, and I've always been kind of interested in puppetry, very stylized performance, and also um, a lot of my early work was on Asian theater and political theater where there's a lot of puppets. So it's always been kind of there, but I wasn't like fully immersed in that puppetry world early on. Um, but I felt sometimes when I got involved in puppetry that, um, you know, I wanted more communication between uh, the world of puppetry, which can sometimes be a little insular, and the sort of world of theater in general, especially scholarship and academia, and that people in other areas of theater should know about what's going on in puppetry and why this is such an exciting form. And um, as I say in the introduction, you know, I kind of take people through a journey of how I came to um, get really involved in puppetry, and, um, it was going to these uh, fe fe Henson festivals in New York, and it was the most exciting theater I was seeing. And I wanted, you know, so uh, it's part of that conversation. So the book is also kind of directed, I mean, I really hope puppeteers will find interesting things in there, but it's also kind of directed at theater people who suddenly become interested in puppetry and they don't really know where to start or what to think about or how to think differently or um, what is this art? And um, sometimes you see shows where people are incorporating a puppet in their theater piece and maybe they need some support in <laughs> thinking differently about you know, what that world is about. Um, and so I wanted to kind of be that bridge, I guess, as well as I think um, one more impulse is that, well, we can, we can sort of talk more about the different chapters. Like I really wanted to start Con more kind of critical conversations about not just how wonderful a puppet is and how mesmerizing that is, which a lot of the theory kind of can sometimes get stalled on, but to start thinking now more about watching puppetry across a production and analyzing that. Yeah, and that really comes across. I'm really excited to talk about that aspect of the, the book. Um, what I want to do before those, you know, there's this, you know, what you're, I have all of these tabs as if I'm going to be able to find everything that I want to find. But I was able to find this sentence um, while you were talking that, that really resonates with what it is you were just saying. Um, you write, once we move ourselves out of the way and put materiality in the center of our thoughts and creativity to see what materiality itself can express, new realms of artistic possibilities open up. So what strikes me is, um, is the way in which, you know, 
we've all seen shows where uh, the prop is the point or the puppet is the point, but the actor is so interested in sort of emoting, right? Or the actor is so interested in drawing attention that they sort of lose touch with the, mo the, 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 the fact that what's, what's, what it's about right then is, you know, Desdemona's scarf, for instance. Um, and I, I feel like the same thing can happen with academic writing. People want to sound smart or they want to impress or they feel like they need to, you know, meet certain bars and um, really celebrate their, their own selves and their own work. Um, and by putting the material, the story of your journey, the resources that are out there, um, you're, you're writing a book that decenters that and really puts the subject itself at the center and therefore allows it to grow. And so that's another thing that really struck me is, you know, not only are you generous in the sense that you don't assume that anybody knows anything coming into it and that that's any sort of problem, but you give call-outs to all the people whose work you've engaged with, all the festivals that you've seen, the people that you've collaborated on projects with. And in so doing, you then point people to sort of who are the people who are asking these same questions on the US theater scene. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that I, I'm really excited about. Yeah, I mean, I really felt um, like it was, uh, the puppetry world has been so um, generous to me and welcoming, I mean, especially as an academic, you know, academia can sometimes be a little bit of a prickly place, right? Um, but uh, I think ever since I've gotten involved in puppetry, um, people, uh, the community is so supportive, so I really did want to, um, make sure that ev that people were uh were um uh as you say called out <laughs> you know I, wa I wanted to honor <laughs> the people who are involved in this community and all the work people do um uh and i want you know want that generosity to spread um so i, I you know sometimes i have to say that, you know i first started writing some of it um, sometimes I had a little bit of an attitude like, I just need to tell them this thing, you know. And then um, after I, you know, then I went through a second draft and I like pulled myself out actually a lot. So I'm glad that that came across. Um, I also wanted to say something else because I was thinking about it recently. Um, when you, we were talking last night about, you know, what the, the tone of the book. And I had started, I realized that in the back of my mind, when I was in college, uh, one of the things I was given to read in some class was um, Robert Edmund Jones' The Dramatic Imagination. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of book which is just like, and I, I realized, I didn't realize this before, but I just looked it up, and it, it's, its subtitle also has the word reflections <laughs> in it, like it's reflections and uh, something else about, about, you know, the theater. And it was just, it was sort of like this, like, let me talk to you about mm -hmm. interesting things I've seen and thoughts I've had and a very different, you know, so not to be a textbook and not to be so scholarly, but let's talk and have an engaging conversation about interesting ideas and maybe a book you feel like kind of, I hope, carrying with you and sort of sitting, you know, and spending a little time with and going back to and that you might kind of, <laughs> you know, I think there are fewer books like that around. Mm -hmm. And um, so somewhere, I wasn't exactly saying I want to do that, but it was somewhere in the back of my mind. And maybe it's a coincidence, but maybe it's not, <laughs> that Robert Emmon Jones directed this production of Stravinsky's Oedipus Rex with these ah. giant puppets that mm. hung over the stage. And he also was, uh, he also worked on Eugene O'Neill's first production of The Great God Brown, where all the characters wear masks on top of masks, oh, and they take off their masks, and there's another mask underneath. So I think, I think that he <laughs> has a, a material sensibility as well. Yeah, the other thing I want to point to, and then we'll start talking about the content of the book, along these same lines, is the wonderful uh, bibliography that you have at the end. So, um, as Nick knows from uh, puppetry at, at Northwestern, um, there are pages and pages and pages of resources that are compiled so that, you know, you've done the, the, the shortcutting for folks who, because puppetry sources, aren't necessarily as easy to find as Shakespeare's sources, 
And so having somebody who's put them all together for you is also a, a really great resource. Yeah, I mean, when I, like I said, when I would teach this class um, and when I've had master's students in it, um, I've always asked them to do you know, a paper at the end. And um, there really weren't, when I first started, there wasn't really a lot of material or material that was easy to get to. And I started collecting a library in my office um, and offering to you know, lend it to students and you know, started making this list. Um, and so this was another thing that I didn't have to you know, necessarily do this time around teaching the class like it's in here, you know. <laughs> um, so, I, and I would often sort of just hand them something and I, as I started doing it, I was thinking, I want uh, the annotation to be kind of, it didn't end up exactly this way, but the idea behind it was like, if you came to my office and said, oh, this is you should read because of, and like me talking mm -hmm. to you, like, oh here, this has, I like this because of that. You know, and that was a little very personal, and in the end I tried to be a little bit more general about what the book does. <laughs> so I didn't quite go all the way through, but that mm -hmm. was a, an impulse too. Okay, fabulous. Let's start talking about the book then. Okay, um, so in, in the first chapter, um, you talk a lot, you, you bring in um, Basil Jones, who's one of the co-founders of the South African company, Handspring Puppet Company. Basil Jones writes this really beautiful piece um, where he talks about um, the, the goal of the puppet or the task of the puppet is always to strive toward life. And that, in, he talks in the, co in the context of War Horse about um, during that production process, that sometimes uh, audience members complained that they couldn't really absorb the spoken text because the puppets were so interesting to watch and that that striving toward life is, um, is mesmerizing and it is the central story of the puppet. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I'll tell you that, you know, actually the first chapter, which is called A Puppet Being and A Puppet Doing, um, wasn't in my original idea. I was trying to jumpstart, like, there's a lot of literature, um, if there's anything in scholarship about puppetry right. early on, about what's captivating about the puppet and the object. And I wanted to move forward on that. Exactly. Like, what else can we talk about in terms of the um, a full production or what's uh, going on? And then, uh, so it wasn't originally there. And then I thought, you know what? I got to start with the object. So let's go back. And then I thought I would dig in a little bit. And I really wanted to use uh, Basil, so wonderful um, in writing about that. Uh, and because he starts the conversation about uh, what is the drama, you know, what is the text, um, and if it's puppets making the text, um, you know, or, or it's trumping, I mean, it sort of gave me also a thing, if it's trumping the written text, then what kind of texts are there? Or mm -hmm. what kind of stories, or how do those emerge, and how do they um, move forward? And uh, he has a wonderful, I mean, uh, I, again, the reason I, I sort of make uh, generous nods to everybody is because um, he has a whole lifetime of working with puppets that, you know, he'll know all kinds of things that I don't about mm -hmm. creating those shows. but. I also wanted to offer uh, maybe a different point of view from my background and my perspective of how, we're, how to make, uh, make a show and what um, to look for and what, if you're not going to trump a text, well then what kind of <coughs> structures or texts or models or shows, uh, journeys are there? How can we move that? So I, mm -hmm. I use him to jump that off, but it also gave me an opportunity to say, well, you know, one of those other things I want my students to know is how we think about the materiality of the puppet and what those choices are. And it's mm -hmm. not just this or that choice. There's every choice, you mm -hmm. know? So the question is, what choices are you making and why? What is it that meaning is expressing on the stage? And to really attune them to that, um, to those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. um, right. And so even though it, you know it, it doesn't negate the fact that we're absolutely fascinated by watching inanimate um, objects come to life, but one of the things that you're, I think probably the main thing your book does or tries to do is to say, okay, once we've established that, actually how objects are designed, um, what they look like, uh, the materials they're made of, uh, how they unfold in time, uh, what the relationship between the puppet and the puppeteer is, where you direct your gaze, what the materials are, all of those things can be anal analyzed with a great deal of sophistication and all of those things can really be mapped out 
um, very carefully and very thoroughly. Um, and so what you're doing um, over the remainder of the book is you're sort of giving folks a window into that. The first chapter where you do that is called The Dramaturgy is in the Object. And I want to talk about two examples from that chapter that explore what this means in two different ways. The first one is the, um, the, uh, the Indian tradition of kavad boxes. Um, we're going to look at an image of that um, in just a second. But what's remarkable about it is that there are every single part of the story, I don't want to, you know, say what you're <laughs> about to say, but what's, what strikes me about that is that every part of the story is sort of already designed into these boxes. Do you want to describe yeah. them while we're waiting for okay, the Okay, so we're going to see this image. Um, so uh, does anybody here know what Kavad box is? couple of people. So um, I, I tell, and one of the things I do in the, in the book, I allow myself, I mean, you talked about, you know, the need um, academically to sort of, you know, uh, cite everything. I sort of allow myself to just, I want to tell stories. <laughs> I want to talk about my journey. So um, the first story I tell in this uh, chapter is about encountering one of these objects. Um, I took students on these study abroad programs to India, and we stopped at this fair, and I um, see these uh, objects, these boxes, and the thing that's amazing about them is um, they, they start closed up, um, and they're beautifully painted, and then um, there's a first set of doors that open, and you go, oh, that's interesting. And then there are these panels that unfold, and they unfold on both sides, and it's like this amazing thing that keeps unfolding. This is um, the artist who built this, uh, Carpenter, who made this particular box. Um, and then at the very end, there's two last panels that open up, and there are um, sculpted figures in the back. Now, they have um, a wonderful uh, tradition um, of ways of using this. Um, Nina Sabnani is just fabulous woman who's a scholar who like has written a fabulous book on this and knows everything about it. Um, and they go to uh, uh, these um, homes out in the deserts of Rajasthan and it's kind of a traveling altar. And she talks about how it's, um, it's constructed to sort of give you the experience of going into a temple and all the different stages of it. I didn't know this at the time and I was just looking at it. And I, of course, um, I think it's, uh, I mean, of course, it's very important. I spend a lot of time studying traditional forms and it's very important to know what the traditions are. So I, I take a little bit of a liberty saying, like I encountered this object and what was exciting to me was maybe not exactly how the tradition uses it. But what I was seeing was a kind of dramaturgy in the object that is an unfolding of a story. So the sort of everything closed up at the beginning where we are in anticipation and we're wondering what is this story going to be about and somehow the story is all encased in it like all the the end is already in the beginning you know it's very dramaturgically satisfying and uh, in that way and then the first doors open it's a kind of introduction and then the physicality and the phenomenology of the opening is this expression of story development and then at the very end these last two doors that open in the back, you get three dimensions. So there are paintings, um, and so what the, the actual puppet uh, performers do of this is they have a peacock feather and they point to the stories as they're telling the stories. Um, and I was kind of saying, okay, well, yes, there, those images are there, but those are the, so two-dimensional images, you're, you, you're looking at that, and then um, suddenly there's this three-dimensional forms in the back. That's kind of an epiphany or something that takes you to another level. So what I saw in the boxes and I thought was instructive, which I wanted to put in that, mm -hmm. is like seeing a structure, something that was object and material and constructed that was expressing dramaturgy, expressing story. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, so uh, then you, you, go, you go on to give a bunch of different examples, um, but one of my favorites, partly because I saw this show at the festival last year, did anybody see Anywhere last year? Yes. yes. So Anywhere is a production by a French company, and it uh, tells the story of Oedipus's wanderings, um, and Oedipus is made of ice, and so he melts over the course of the production, and so Another thing you talk about then is what happens when the material itself tells a story, and in this, t in this case, it's the degradation of material over time. What does ice do in warm places? It melts, and then how does that capture the story of Oedipus as well? Yeah, so um, in the book, one of the things I'm talking about is um, that, uh, 
sorry, just thinking about it, now it's gone out of my head, uh, that materiality, oh, so that, you know, the excitement of puppetry, right, uh, what makes the art exciting is animated material, right, uh, the inanimate becoming animate. If that's the case, then that's where the excitement is and the story is in that, is somehow in that. So how does that happen? And this is a wonderful example um, because, and I also talk a lot about like expectation, like we already know if it's an ice, like if I say ice puppet, you're like, oh, what is that? <laughs> like, and then you're like thinking, how do they keep it going? Like you know what it does. And so it's appealing to all of our really tactile and uh, you know, uh, sensibilities and our knowledge about this material in its expressing the story. And it already has its own physical journey in it. Mm -hmm. And then that journey maps on and connects with the journey of the story. And um, anywhere is uh, also, it's not the, the um, Oedipus, um, uh, the third of the trilogy uh, mm -hmm. of Oedipus um, that uh, um, uh, where uh, in, the, uh, in the ancient Greek drama, he actually um, goes into this clearing and they go to find him and he's disappeared, mm -hmm. you know, and, but, it's, but it riffs off of that, I mean, yeah. and obviously is capturing that idea. And so the idea that your puppet is actually going to disappear, so there's this kind of, so what I'm interested in is like, what are the pleasures of puppetry? Where do you find the, the juiciness and the excitement? And it's like, there's all the things that a puppeteer is doing and this is a kind of extra exciting because the material is actually alive mm -hmm. itself. It's telling its own story in the telling. And where those two come together for me is exciting. And so what I'm trying to kind of impart in the book, it's a lot of wonderful things about puppetry, but what excites me is maybe something mm -hmm. like that where these, uh, this is happening together with mm -hmm. the story. And you talk a lot, I, I made sort of a list um, of things that you talk about that really struck me along these same lines. You talk about the pleasure that the audience gets. You, you talk about transformation. You talk about unlocking possibilities. You talk about unfolding and playing with expectations. You talk about invitation. And there's a way in which, um, in your analysis of puppetry, it's really very fundamentally audience centric and it 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 captures at least you know in in your analysis and the examples you use it really captures the the things that we find most pleasurable about theater right um, so I, I want to talk about the next chapter though um, uh, can uh, there's a, a graph that you use um, this chapter next chapter is called the image aspect of the puppet um, uh, and you make a distinction between objects and images. And I want to make sure that you get a chance to explain this because I don't want to get it wrong. But what we've been talking about so far is, you know, the materials of the object or the way that the object unfolds over time. You're also talking about the design of the object. And in this chapter, you, you begin by talking about a lot of flat, forms, you know, uh, ranging from comic book style puppetry to Wayang Kulit to the work of Hamid Rahmanian, whose uh, Song of the North was shown here last weekend, um, to scroll traditions. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think the image aspect of the puppet makes a, a kind of meaning that's distinct from, say, the materials? Okay, that's great. Um, I want to just, uh, talking to your, your last point about the um, audience perspective, that um, I kind of think of this book like an introduction, like uh, there's a lot of ways people are introduced to puppetry and often it's about how to build a puppet or how to perform a puppet. Mm -hmm. And um, I think of this as a kind of introduction in terms of how you watch. Mm -hmm. Like what are we watching mm -hmm. for and how is puppetry, as I say, asking us to watch maybe differently than other kinds of theater. Um, so this, you know, um, it's not, I, I'm not saying that the book is like fully, crisply delineated all the elements of puppet in a nice order. You know, um, I was excited about uh, imagery and thinking about, first of all, a lot of contemporary puppeteers who are bringing, like if you bring on a stage something which is a picture, you know, where, how does that become an interesting new way of thinking about it? And, um, you know, I guess if we look at this, um, so I started this I thinking about this idea of the two aspects of, of the puppet, where we talk a lot about um, the kinetic uh, way the puppet is built and the objectness of it, uh, but of course it has all these visual qualities. And I didn't quite 
go into an analysis of the visual qualities of particular puppets, and I hope somebody here, perhaps, who is really a visual artist could do that, because uh, that's a great thing to have, and I don't know have a, that you know, background to go into that detail. But what I was looking at was, and actually this came really early when I first started doing puppetry, and we were thinking, we were l a lot of things were starting to be using early on computers online, and I started thinking of like all the fonts on, uh, on uh, yeah words and then the words dancing and like this image becoming kind of a puppet and where was this and then all the ways in which as you see here like picture storytelling animation film people always ask me is that you know part of puppetry and I'm like yeah but why you know um, and so hopefully here and I'm sure there's you know theoretical things people can also think about on this um, and we can have conversations but there's things that sort of gather around the idea of picture maybe is even a, almost a better term than image and things that gather around the idea of object mm -hmm. and they also overlap and something like the pop-up book is a kind of interesting thing where it's in the realm of picture and then the picture comes to life off the page and like are we excited because that's an inanimate thing becoming animate or because it's a picture becoming an object um, you know that it's the picture that's brought to life rather than the object that's brought to life mm -hmm. um, so I, um, I kind of tease out in this chapter some of these like uh, examples where we're um, looking between things or thinking about how images um, are brought onto stage uh, we might go to this uh, picture. Yeah, let's go to the Blind Summit Yeah, one next. Um, so this is the, co the picture I chose for the cover of the book. Um, Blind Summit, you probably, maybe if you, you know about it, it's a wonderful company from the UK, and what they're most famous for is their show The Table. How many people have seen The Table? Or some version of it, which has a Bunraku-style puppet. It's very funny, very wonderful. A puppet called Moses, who yeah. doesn't tell much about the story of Moses. But he tells a lot about Bunraku puppetry. And I tend to be excited about puppetry that questions the form or tells us and teaches us something about what the form is and what it can do. Um, but I first saw this show along with that. And this one is, tends to be less known. It's called Paper Story. And um, I used it as the cover of the book because I thought like, well, the book says reading the puppet stage. And there's definitely some things here to read. but. What is going on? Are these puppets, or are they? What are they? They're pictures. Are they puppets? Are they pictures? And what are the like the people there? What are they doing? Like I hope it asks it asks you to ask questions about you know how the title of this book relates to what we're seeing here. And um, in this show, uh, the four performers uh, open up this suitcase. Uh, the attache case that they put on the table, and the entire show is them pulling these pictures one out of another out of this and showing them to the audience. So the pictures are on their own telling a kind of visual story, but the way they're pulled out, the way that they're then set up, the, the motion and you know rhythm of how they disappear is adding to that story. So. Um, I find this kind of exciting to think about in terms of what is the picture doing and then what is the object doing. And you might not, um, I mean, a piece of paper, it's so thin, maybe it's not a, like, what kind of an object is that? You know, it doesn't have all those kinetic things. And yet, here's this fascinating pr production that is done where it's riffing off of these, um, these two ideas and, the, and what the images are doing have a role in relationship to the object makes you think more about that distinction, perhaps. And it's a really it's a really great example of sort of how puppetry, even if you want to focus on sort of one aspect of uh, of analysis, there's so much hybridity going on. And so in this instance, you have these comic book style drawings, but then you have this virtuosic choreography by the performers, and I would imagine then you also have the sort of feel of the paper and the sound of the paper and the ability to crumple paper and the, you know, the, the rippling sound of the paper as it gets pulled out. Um, and another, another artist that you... Yeah. That and then I was going to say just the yeah. paper surprises, like you see these papers and then suddenly there's this long paper. Right, 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 yeah. Um, and another... Uh, example that you include in this same chapter is the example of Claire Dolan who um, runs this Banners and Cranks Festival and you know there's this 
an, another form of storytelling tradition where you have all of these painted or drawn images and then you point to the images and then you're able to tell the story that way. But she, of course, does that in this different way where she creates this hybrid costume storyboard. Yeah. Um, I, first, I want to say something. There's a lot of um, examples in the um, in the book, uh, in this chapter, about scroll storytelling traditions. And I think people involved in puppetry really understand that as part of puppetry. But then when you think about it, like, you know, why is that? <laughs> um, so I guess that's also an impulse here. Uh, so she does this wonderful, if you've ever seen, been to a Banners and Cranks festival that she's um, put together, at the beginning she um, sings this history of picture storytelling. And um, she does it by um, pointing to all of these things that are on this, images that are on the um, dress she's wearing uh, that, um, tell the story, the history. Um, and so she sings and she's telling the history. And so, so there's the pictures, like, you know, you could have a scroll, like we have this banner here, and there are traditions where, you know, you just point to the different images and, um, you know, tell the story as a narrator, and it's um, either unfurled or you're basically looking at the images in this way. But now suddenly we have this other element that's brought in um, because not only is it this wonderful um, dress that has these panels that open up in all these new ways, but then in the middle she'll, like, spin around, you know, and then she's got to like, th some things are on her back, she's got to turn. So we suddenly have this, you know, human performer who's performing these images, um, and they're all coming together. So um, I, I like your word hybridity. Maybe it's not so much about pulling apart these different what's image, what's object, but trying to think about where movement's coming from, mm. where expression is coming from, and in that way tease apart the analysis. And again, for the sake of understanding why it's interesting or exciting, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, this is very exciting to me that, you know, she's first, because uh, you're then part of your brain is also interested in this uh, dress she's built <laughs> mm -hmm. and what's going to open next and, um, you know, where on her body a certain image is and how we're relating and already thinking about her body in relationship to these physicalities, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this, this imagery. Both of these examples, I think, help us uh, transition to the last main body chapter of the book, which is about humans and objects, and about the many, many different ways you can have uh, really dynamic relationships between the puppet and the puppeteer. And one of the examples you talk about in that chapter is based on, I mean, y y you give this wonderful sort of a story of a journey of giant puppets in streets that you weren't able to see. <laughs> but what you do talk about close to the end of that chapter is a project that you worked on, which was uh, Tom Lee and Koryu Nishikawa V's Shanks Mare, which was shown here, I think, uh, two, or three two or three festivals ago. Um, and uh, one of the, and, and uh, Koryu Nishikawa V uses this um, tradition that's been in his family since the 1800s of kurume ninyo, or cart puppetry. He's sitting, you can't see it that much in this image, but he's sitting on this little cart that allows him to, uh, and he, he attaches the puppet's feet to his own feet, and then he can roll very seamlessly around the stage in this beautiful way. Some of you may have seen Paper Moon use, um, use that same technique that they, that they learned from, from these artists as well. Um, but one of the things that's really striking is it also allows the puppeteer's face to be really close to the puppet. So if you could talk about sort of what you've discovered in terms of how we analyze the relationship between the puppet and the puppeteer. Yeah, um, well I was um, uh, on a Fulbright recently. Um, I'd spent a lot of time uh, in Japan years ago and then I was able to go back on a Fulbright and um, uh, look at um, ritual, puppets in ritual in Japan. And um, I, was, I was seeing a lot of these puppets and I think um, I found it when talking about the relationship of the puppeteer to the puppet, um, it struck me that it would be really interesting to use uh, Japanese puppets as an example, partly because I know a lot about them and I want to tell people about what I know, uh, but also because there are several different traditions that are using very similar style puppets, but the relationship of the puppeteer to that puppet is different. Mm -hmm. So those of you who know what we mostly talk about is bunraku um, and the Japanese bunraku tradition as done in Osaka at the National Theater in Osaka, um, or Ningyo Joruri as it's also called, uses exactly the same puppet more or less. I mean, it doesn't have the pegs on the bottom, but very similar puppet. And in fact, these, this tradition grew out of that tradition um, at a 
point when puppetry became less um, popular in Japan after a big heyday, this tradition and getting three people for every puppet was really expensive, you know? Um, and they found a way to do one, the same fully articulated character, but with one person. Um, and this using the cart. And suddenly the puppet can do different things. And um, uh, as you say, there's this intimate relationship because uh, in the Bunraku theater, the, the, we also can see the master puppeteer. Uh, but because there are those three performers and they're trying to all choreograph together, they're sort of trying all the time to stay behind the puppet and to stay out of each other's way in a certain sense. Um, but here, it's like there's this immediate connection and um, the, it's almost like, like uh, I don't drive a stick shift, but it's a little bit like driving a stick shift, I imagine. You know, you've got your arms moving and your, your feet and your your whole body's moving at once. Um, and your, the expression, especially from a master puppeteer here, and um, we can talk about that, we have a wonderful um, analysis of this in another book that Dasi and I are, are working on from a, uh, one of your students. By Northwestern students. grad student, Ana Diaz yeah, Barriga. That, um, and I think this puppet, this particular chapter is all about the fact that the, it's not just a visible or an invisible puppeteer, right? There's all kinds of ways to be visible. And that the puppeteer here really is imparting and very skillfully choosing how to impart emotion of their own to our view of that um, act performer and puppet. And um, Nishikawa has also developed a um, flamenco performance where, because this puppet does a lot of stomping, uh, and he does a kind of flamenco dance with um, a, a puppet that's a flamenco dancer, not this kind, but, and he, you, when you see him do it, and his son, who's really getting to be a very fabulous puppeteer, also is learning this now, um, probably mastered it by now, um, you can see like that bravado, I guess, of the Spanish dancer that he completely changes his own um, mm. physicality mm. and uh, the, you know, the dancer is, you know, doing all these uh, very flamenco style movements. So um, it's definitely there. And then there's another form called uh, Otome Bunraku or Young Women's Bunraku, which is another relationship of the same kind of puppet. Um, it was, I don't want to go into all history now, but, you know, yeah. started as a women's form um, to basically see the beautiful young women <laughs> at a time when <laughs> that was very exciting on the Japanese stage behind the puppet standing up and kind of dancing with them. And again, um, there, are, there are obviously differences. Some might be slightly bigger puppets or slightly mm -hmm. they have to change them the way they manipulate, but they all come out of this same tradition, but the relationship of the performer to the object is different. And so it's a, it's, I think it's a good set of examples to highlight Mm -hmm. Same kind of puppet, basically, mm -hmm. but different f forms giving you, I mean, we look at them as traditions, so they have a certain kind of tradition, but when you start, let's say you weren't in that specific tradition or like the flamenco one, like what can you mine mm -hmm. or what can you think about or get out or what kind of meaning can be created in that choice? Mm -hmm. I want to transition to... Uh, audience questions, because I'm sure you have many. But as a part of doing that, I want to make one last comment. And if we could look at the, uh, the Harry Ape uh, Aunt Shocked photo um, for this. What I noticed is that your, the story of your book sort of comes full circle. What you do is you, in this, again, really generous way, you begin with sort of your own journey and your own path of discovery. And you celebrate all the people that you encountered along that journey. And at the end, you celebrate your students and you celebrate um, their discoveries. And there's this sort of equalizing um, that, uh, that you um, bring into the telling of that story by, um, by just uh, essentially showing all of us when you do pay attention to these d different elements and when you celebrate the material m materiality of the object and when you decenter yourself, then it unlocks all kinds of material possibilities and all kinds of ways of exp expressing things that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of. If you want, you know, like 30 second version, <laughs> but I, I want to make sure that we, uh, that we, yeah. we leave time for I questions I love my as students. Well. <laughs> One of them is sitting right here. <laughs> and that if I can reel them in and get them involved in puppetry, then 
oh great, there's more people who can help me out because <laughs> I'm not super talented at anything. And you know, like, oh wow. Like I just started my puppetry class um, the semester um, yesterday and uh, nobody's a puppeteer. People come from all, all different kinds of backgrounds and it's like, oh, you have some art skills. Oh, you have that. Okay, yeah, let's all like, we're gonna, you're all gonna be collaborating a little while. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, I was, I mean, I, it was just a joy to be able to work with students and then they get excited and then they wanna do more things and um, yeah. so I guess that's it. And yeah. then I, I forget what word you used. Oh yeah, um, you, 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 you talk about uh, the, the, the joy of them all being infected with puppet disease. Yes. <laughs> to animate yeah. things. <laughs> all right, uh, let's turn it over to you all for you questions. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, the question was, what was the project that sparked your curiosity for puppetry? Yeah. Um, so uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s in New York, the Henson Foundation was sponsoring with the pup uh, public theater in New York this series of puppet festivals that brought puppetry from around the world. And uh, they were very popular in New York. And, um, uh, you know, I was just seeing like really unusual things. And I think what was, um, what was I was responding to is there was like some puppet shows that had like beautiful puppets, but like, they were doing Shakespeare or something, and it like just it felt like too much language, and I didn't know how to think about that. And um, um, El Periférico de Objetos, this uh, Argentinian company, did this show with these um, dolls. They were like f old dolls, um, and it's about violence. Uh, it's a story of, of, of violence. I had to like go look it up again when I was writing about it because I, I just remember um, being so kind of astonished these um, old dolls that they had found and the way they were being used and then the sort of violent things that happened and I, there was like so much information coming at me visually and I like, was like this is blowing my mind but I don't know what's going on and mm -hmm. I want to talk mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I tell as part of this journey in the book is I was, I offered to teach a course at the CUNY Graduate Center where they have these PhD um, classes on puppetry because I was thinking like, let me get those graduate students who are so smart, they're reading all that theory, like let's all talk and then they'll tell me what's going <laughs> on, you know. Um, uh, and then those puppet shows were, uh, the festivals were canceled. <laughs> like they stopped happening and I was like, oh, well I already committed to teaching this class, so what am I gonna do? Um, uh, but, you know, I was like, I, I, I you know, I, I was, saying like, I want someone to explain what's going on and I want to know how to think about this and I was trying to find material and there maybe have been things, maybe more in Europe, you know, that uh, one could look at, but I was struggling um, and thinking what, 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 you know, st stuff I was looking for wasn't explaining these things to me. Hmm. Another, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the um, uh, uh, yeah, the, they'll bring you a microphone. Um, and in India, I've spent, in India. yeah. Have you been in the puppet tradition? Are there other areas of the world where you do? Um, the, the, qu the question was, do, do Japan and India and other areas of the world have big puppet traditions? Uh, yeah, Japan and India both have lots of puppet mm -hmm. traditions. Uh, they are fabulous places to find out. I actually started going to India because I was taking students uh, created from another series of stories. I like telling stories, I won't tell them all now, but um, started a, um, a study abroad program in India with a colleague uh, taking students to study Kathakali dance drama. And, uh, but I was also getting interested in puppetry and then all kinds of things started happening that I started connecting to a lot of puppeteers there. Um, and there are st every kind of string, shadow, rod, um, all kinds of puppetry depending on what area you're in. Um, traditional forms that are related um, to a, a ritual, um, often talking, uh, telling stories of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana epics. Um, in Japan, uh, also a lot of puppet traditions. Um, I really went, I had uh, this Fulbright that I had a few years ago. Um, I was saying I wanted to look at ritual, uh, puppetry that take place in ritual, like festivals and other um, uh, things like that. And one of the reasons I, c I constructed it that way and then in didn't just end up looking at those was I wanted to look at basically everything that's not Bunraku. It was like, um, I love Bunraku, it's so gorgeous. And there is a lot of stuff written on Bunraku, but there's a lot of other things the puppet traditions. Most of them happen maybe just once a year at a festival, you know, so it's not like a full entertainment world. Um, 
but different interesting forms of manipulation and different kinds of puppets. So I just wanted to know more about that and share it in other ways. So I've been giving talks about what I've seen. Um, and these things aren't unknown. I mean, they're, uh, they're all uh, cultural assets. And there are places that people have written about them. But I just felt like um, in the kind of uh, conversations that um, I was having people who knew a lot about puppetry, if you said Japan, what they said was Bunraku, which of course is important and it's beautiful. And, um, and I want them to know about some of the other lovely traditions that they could be interested in. Yeah, some of those traditions have been a around for a thousand years, have yeah. been continuously performed for a thousand years. Yes. Okay. What Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. What do you think is the American tradition of puppetry oh, no. versus <laughs> something that's been around for thousands and thousands uh, of years? And how does it rank to it? OK, <laughs> well. Um, this is when I turn to John Bell. John Bell, <laughs> you're the American John Bell's of puppetry. Book, American puppet modernism. Yes. Um, <laughs> because I think if, if we say something, okay, this is a really huge generalization, and people who've been involved in a lot of American puppetry for a long time uh, will uh, should be very critical of me. But um, <laughs> we tend in the United States to be more interested in innovation, in personal, um, uh, uh, you know, artistry of a particular artist rather than the establishment and um, a perpetuation of a tradition. Um, so I think that's an important, uh, it's not that we, they don't have that in other pl places too, but I think that's so much part of how America thinks about um, art, you know, um, which again is huge generalization. So, uh, you know, let's put that in caveats, but I think that's a, 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 a big thing. Um, and being able to borrow from any tradition, which can become problematic mm. when you're looking at other forms, et cetera. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, we're gonna talk tomorrow when uh, my colleague Tim Cusack is here uh, about the book on puppet and spirit, uh, forms that are, you know, connected to, in other countries of, that are connected to, and I go a lot to Asia, so I don't um, write so much about puppetry in Europe, um, so that's just my background is more in Asian theater, so I'm, I'm usually ca talking from that perspective where there's a lot of traditions that are related to ritual and connected in deep social ways to communities, um, not thought about as you know puppets for children, but for the whole community, because it's, um, and in Africa you get this too, puppets that are for teaching stories that are moral tales or about social, uh, social ways of being. Um, and so th there, there are traditions that, uh, please uh, find them in the US and argue against me, uh, but there are a lot more traditions in maybe other places that have long roots in connecting to the community and not just being an entertainment mm. element performance, maybe that might be. You know, what you're saying reminds me, some folks may not know who Ellen Van Volkenberg is, yeah. who gives this series uh, its name. She invented the word puppeteer um, and was a, a Chicago puppeteer, one of the founders of the Chicago Little Theater, all about the innovation that you're talking about, all about sort of exploring what was possible and did this beautiful Midsummer Night's Dream in this building over 100 years ago. Oh. Is this, was it in this <laughs> same? Yeah, fabulous. Okay, uh, we have time for, uh, we've got five minutes left, so we've got time for one, one, two more questions. Uh, do you have any examples of shows where an individual object or puppet is through the production uh, m manipulated in different ways, like that changes uh, because of the plot? Uh, oh, um, yeah. I mean, I, uh, th I'm sure there are a million of them. Where, where it's the the uh, yes, actually, I do. Um, there's I, I talk about um, uh, a show that Hank Borwinkle from Triangle Theater uh, in uh, Holland uh, did that I was able to see many years ago, um, which is a puppet uh, that looks um, like a marionette, and it. Um, it does a kind of trope that you see sometimes in uh, puppet shows, right? It looks up and it sees the marionettist and the hand, you know, is very expressive and uh, it starts to try and, you know, climb up the strings and there's this little fight. And then um, uh, finally it yanks down the, the control and the, um, the marionettist drops the control. But the puppet then, like, falls down, of course, but then comes back to life and picks up the control and carries it over its shoulder like it's carrying a cross, you know? 
And so you suddenly become aware there's also a puppeteer somewhere underneath. So that's a change in how it's, I mean, I don't know how, if it's always manipulated that way, or I mean, if it really is a marionette, and that, like, I don't know that all the details, but um, yeah, that would be a change in manipulation that is drama a dramaturgy, that's a story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great question. Wow, I came great up with question. That. <laughs> okay, one more quick one. Yes. Uh, microphone will come to you. Um, just thinking about that word center and, and decentering. Is the, and I'm trying to think, is there a way to define when people walk in as the audience what they think the center is? You know, even going back to like Shakespeare and the Globe. I mean, what's the, what's the thing that's either that we're de-doing? What's the center as you would define it that people walk in thinking this is our center? Because you, you, everything you're talking about is sort of taking away some assumption that we walk in with when we read the puppet, but now we're going to... Oh, no, I think um, it's all a uh, conversation with um, our horizon of expectations. Um, I think this is in theater as well as in puppetry that... Um, uh, that, that center's always changing. The more people see more puppetry, the more they're exposed to ideas and they come in with expectations of what that is. And artists play with those expectations, both fulfilling and then sometimes veering away from. Uh, one of the things that I, I give an example of is another Borwinkle uh, piece where there's um, a character that pops out, that comes down, it's a big head on stage, and this character comes down and the head has a bandage around it and the character like takes the bandage off um, the head with a, uh, with a stick and then it gets wrapped around the stick and then um, the character just holds that and then the stick starts, the, the bandage just starts to unravel on its own and you know, we just watch that as a moment and that it's both fulfilling an expectation because we know what happens like with ice, what happens with this bandage mm -hmm. and gravity, but it's also not what we expected necessarily to see because it's a puppet show where we're thinking about puppetry and manipulation. And so I think um, it's a realm of, that's the realm of creativity is what, what do you want to say and how are you mm -hmm. bringing people in and taking them out and like mm -hmm. playing with their engagement. Um, expectation, not expectation. Sometimes you fulfill it perfectly, mm -hmm. like we're waiting for that thing to explode or we're waiting, you know, and sometimes you don't give it to us. As long as you're making the choices and you know what you're doing, you know, right. that's I think where the artistry is. Yeah, that's a great, great place to <laughs> end. Uh, thank you everybody for coming out today thank and you. thank you Claudia for and sharing thank your you, book. Thank you, Dacia. Thank you and thank you, Dacia, for being so generous.